is Promise Theory and what is its connection to DevOps? Promise Theory is actually a, a description that I came up with to analyze distributed systems when I was trying to rewrite CF Engine to learn the lessons that we uh, learned from 15 years of usage actually. Um, and what I discovered is that there are really no good theories in computer science to describe distributed systems, which might sound like a paradox, but I guess the, the theories of computing come from the world of linear sequential processing, Turing machines, and that, that mathematics, which is not really the way that computers work today in the modern world. And so I needed some kind of a way to approach uh, distributed systems and also to be able to talk about policy because uh, CF Engine is a policy-oriented approach to managing systems. And we really didn't have a theory of policy either in, in computer science that went beyond, say, access control. That's where most of the work had been done uh, in access control. So I came up with promise theory one day in 2004 um, that the idea of a promise would be kind of like a little nugget or an atom of policy. When I keep my promise to you, I'm saying I, it, it is my policy to behave in this way towards you in the future, and I will attempt to keep that promise. And it, the nice thing about it is that it also captures the idea that this isn't a guarantee, it's not deterministic. I may fail to keep my promise to you, but I will do my best in some sense. And you, you then form an expectation from that promise, and you adjust your behavior accordingly. So what's nice about it is it also becomes a theory about cooperation between humans. And it doesn't really matter whether the things making the promises are human or machines. Um, it applies equally well. One of the examples that I give in my book, uh, uh, In Search of Certainty, is how you can get a piece of furniture to make a promise. Because people often sort of do a double take and the promises can apply to inanimate objects. But you can start out with saying, <clears throat> um, you phone the guy at uh, room service at the, at the help desk um, and ask for a sandwich or something. At the front desk of the hotel, you ask for a sandwich. And then you, uh, you ring the front desk of the hotel for a sandwich. And you anonymize the person involved with the intent to serve you with a sandwich. And you just take away that person out of the picture because he's kind of irrelevant. Might even be replaced by another person later in a shift. And you say that the table itself will promise you the sandwich, which sounds weird, but it's actually very practical. So it's kind of a form of uh, abstraction, as we do in all kinds of computer science, to express intent between things and people uh, and objects and how they will then work together, which is perfect for DevOps, where you have, say, a team, not uh, depersonalizing a person, but to a team, how will a team work with another team and cooperate at to make their jobs, um, you know, to make that communication work better, form expectations of one another's behavior and really learn to understand each other as almost like a friendship between them. So it's really shifting the focus, the workflow focus away from tools and on to the people. Um, you could say that, but I would actually like the, the tools to be on an equal footing to the people because the in a, in a cooperation, you, you're, the tools are as much involved in that process as the humans. The humans are always, you can always trace the intent back to a human somewhere, of course, but um, the technology is as important to the process as the humans. So one of the examples that I give is, I ask people when I'm giving talks, you know, how many hours a day do you spend talking to your husbands, wives, spouses, friends, and so on. And it's, you know, a few hours a day. How many hours a day do you now spend editing in VI or Emacs? And this is like 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day. The actual length of relationship people have with the tools is way bigger than the, tool, the relationships they have with the people. So we'd better get that right as well. So I think it's, you have to encompass the whole thing in a com common framework. And that was really what Promise Theory was about, I would say. Well, and given the human involvement, the theory doesn't assure that the promises will be kept, no. right? Yeah. What happens when the promises are broken? 
you try again and you keep trying hopefully so like, that's kind of, that, that's an interesting question so it's really a question about do you intend to make these promises persistent or are they like a one off uh, off the cuff promise that doesn't mean too much we ma- in the human world we make promises like we don't really mean them like we, it's a very easy form of currency we, we say I promise honest, honestly I promise you know, really I promise and we're not really sure if we mean it but if we're going to take this, the theory seriously we need to have a theory which um, where we do intend to keep those promises and then over what period of time do we intend to keep the promises do they eventually go out of date do we need to replace them with new promises how do we adapt and that's really about figuring out how how to adapt. So adaptation of these promises comes into play as well. Um, yeah. So why is the system more reliable than the top-down management approach? I think uh, the top-down management approach, which is the classical approach, is is based on what I would call an, uh, the obligation model, where you say you must do this, you you must behave in this way. And it's kind of the way we think about society because it's uh, it's a brain model. You know, we we form an intention and we say, I want you to do this. It's like a remote control. It's it's like 20 years in front of the TV has has brainwashed us into thinking we can just remote control everything from afar. And it doesn't work that way, right? You need to secure the cooperation through dialogue. which is shocking to many people, but the models don't take that into account. So we still believe that if once we push the button, it will simply happen, you know, engage, make it so, and it will, it will happen. But what's nice about the promise thing is that it up front tells you that you've got to secure that cooperation between the agents. They've got to be both involved in this voluntary cooperation loop, and therefore if it doesn't work the first time, you, it's implicit that you will keep trying to keep that promise. And so the persistence comes from, just as the friendship or the relationship with the tool or the person comes from, how often do you say hi, how are you doing? Um, real processes also follow that kind of pattern and you have to keep revisiting the issue saying, did this succeed in making that happen or not? Top-down management, make it so. Do they come back and check? Do they form a relationship or not? And if they do form a relationship, it's really, um, the relationship is really a promise one, which looks like an obligation where people say, okay, I voluntarily accept your instructions or your policy, and I promise to comply with that because I'm subordinating myself to your better judgment, or I'm agreeing to allow you to be the coordinator of this process, or however we want to phrase it. But even in the military, you know, the soldiers who may seem to be under a strict command are basically saying I give up my autonomy to you as my commanding officer on a voluntary basis I promise not to go AWOL too often or or, or whatever Um, so it's a voluntary thing which just appears to be like a top-down command I think the distinction is very important to understand because uh, what the promise thing does is it gives you insight into all of those things that could go wrong if one of those promises is not kept, you realize that, that could, it, could, it could fail. Whereas with the obligation thing, you just assume that it's going to and throw it over the wall, um, fire and forget, take it for granted it's going to work, and you maybe never check. So it's kind of a risky approach to management. What led you to develop this theory? Was there a particular failure or experience you had that inspired you? It started out for me to find a way to describe the way that CF Engine worked. Because intuitively, back in 1993, when I started CF Engine, I had intuitively made CF Engine in this autonomous, voluntary corporation way. And it was partly about the security model, making things small, failure domains, tight, uh, you know, inability to force another object to comply with a... um, so it was kind of intuitive and as I said there were no models in computer science who could, that could do this so I wanted to make one up myself that was more like CF Engine and then the more that I looked at it the more I realized how general it was and how it applied to human computer interactions and other, other aspects of management of people in fact just systems in general and whether the systems can consist of machines and, and or people doesn't really matter that much it's 
In fact, it's about the the implementation of intent and how you bring intent on an equal footing to the doing, the actions, the dynamical changes that happen in a system. So, and you know, my background is in physics, and my physics brain kicks in and, and says, there's a simple way to formal, formalize these things in using this kind of a physics of things where we can actually put intent, which is not part of physics, you know, uh, purpose and, and uh, purpose, intent, and interpretation, meaning, doesn't enter into physics at all. How can we bring that on an equal footing to the description of the dynamics? How fast, how big, how, how much volume, how much time? Bring those two things together. And that was really how it came about. Um, what I find interesting is when people look at promise theory, they, they see it almost as a manifesto to, to go away from top-down control, centralized control, to become more decentralized which is certainly not incompatible with the theory, but being a good theory, it, uh, a good theory can also analyze the, the top-down and the centralized approach, compare it to the other one, and then make judgments about, allow you to form judgments about which one is suited to a particular scenario. I think it doesn't dismiss top-down, it doesn't dismiss centralization. All of these things have their place, you know, the, the brain model, as I said earlier, is, uh, is a centralized kind of top-down signaling approach. The decentralized approach is more like a society approach. Brain models don't scale. You know, even the big dinosaurs were relatively small compared to a society. Society models do scale, but they're much harder to understand. So often we go for the easy thing, which is the brain model, uh, and then we get into trouble, and only then do things sort of break up into a society of cooperation. DevOps, I think, is interesting because it says, take a look at these corporations, guys. It's actually this society of silos that you often see in organizations are somewhat isolated. And to bring them into a bigger society, a unified picture, we need to form relationships across those uh, boundaries. So I think promise theory is saying starts from the view that everything is independent how can we come together and then DevOps is kind of starting from we've got these silos that are independent how can we bring them together and right changing directions just a bit and kind of dovetailing on the, the physics part that you were talking about before you wrote a post recently called the making of a software wind tunnel in which you argue that dimensional analysis and scaling theory can be applied to software development. What would that look like? How would it work? And what kind of benefits would we see from that? I wrote this blog post to try and answer that question for myself, actually. Uh, again, my physics brain. So, so dimensional analysis is um, one of those boring bits of physics, which turns out to be one of the most profound bits of physics. It's, how, it's about how we measure things in units. You know, how many feet, inches, meters, miles, whatever something is, how much does it weigh? And one of the key insights is that all those measurements are completely irrelevant unless you can compare them in ratios, which are so, so-called dimensionless ratios. So meters divided by meters gives you like an aspect ratio on the screen, it tells you its shape. It doesn't matter if you measure it in feet, meters, miles, the ratio is the same. Um, and that turns out to have all kinds of, when you take it to its logical conclusion, it has all kinds of implications about how things scale up. Are we able to scale systems to large and small sizes? Or is there something that traps you at a particular scale and says this will only work if it's two feet across? Or in the sake of a computer, will this only work if it's a gigahertz processor and not you know, a five gigahertz processor? if it's got this much memory or not this much memory, if it's one computer or 10,000 computers. Um, I wanted to answer this question for computer science because today with web scale, obviously, uh, and you know, frameworks like CF Engine and the kind of web scale uh, applications like Facebook and Google, all of these kinds of systems it's not trivial that we can make them work at large scale. And we see 
certain points in the system, particularly in the, as we go down the stack to the networking, which struggle to scale according to these ways. And I wanted to answer the question is, can we see, can we understand how the, all of the parts need to change in order for this just to scale indefinitely? Or as you'd say in physics, become scale independent. And what I realized as, as I was writing this is that there are certain things in software itself which pin you to a certain scale, which, which don't allow you to grow beyond a certain point unless you ra radically rethink your architecture. What I think is interesting about web scale is that it has rethought that architecture as a service-oriented approach. What some people, like Netflix of the world, for example, called microservices, but just a service-oriented approach where you're trying to build a parallelized view of everything rather than the classical software engineering approach which is much very monolithic stack like you know, top down again oriented stack like approach to something uh, which is which basically has to be powered by brute force throwing more and more resources at this uh, strongly coupled tower will allow you to brute force your way out of a problem to a certain extent but then you hit a limit in Moore's law and memory consumption and the cost of building this thing not least or even the power consumption or the heat generation whatever the thing is that's the, the throttle and you realize that, that that just isn't going to cut it but the parallelized approaches that we're using in web scale companies today is the way to make things scale independent and it's happening in very much the same way that materials scale in the world of physics. You have little atomic pieces which may be strong or weak, but it's only when you build them into materials like the, the tabletop here at a way bigger scale than that. And then the interactions between them, the promises between them, if you like, or the, the binding, the chemical bonds between them, when you've got enough of them that the individual things don't matter as much as the whole, that's when you're approaching scaling and scale-free behavior. And I think that's where we see the industry going today. And the software wind tunnel, it's probably 10 years off. The best we have today, I would say, is code analysis tools that will do, say, profiling of a loop. Or, uh, and a loop is a scale which pins you to a particular size because it costs you to run that loop. So. We're starting, we're in the infancy of understanding scaling behavior, I would say, in software systems. And we're way down at the level of nanotechnology, whereas we need to you know, get to the level of uh, material science, which is the web scale, I guess. And then we'll start to build systems in a very different way to the way we do today. Why hasn't this approach been attempted before, do you think? I think we haven't really seriously had the technology reliable enough for business to rely on it to be able to build at that scale before and of course you, you need to fund these things um, feel sorry for the networking uh, providers because you know, their, their margins are being shrunk all the time we, we demand more and more bandwidth for less and less price all the time and so you know that they're, they're working hard to try to deliver the services we all crave and um, the, the business case for it is, is only really now becoming viable, I would say. Um, so that's probably the reason. I think we've probably had the wherewithal to understand this for a long time, but it's only when it becomes comes into the public consciousness that we actually can make these things happen. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Sure.